Hello and welcome to this Australian BioCommons workshop on translating workflows into Nextflow with Janice. My name is Melissa Burke. I'm the Australian BioCommons Training and Communications Officer and I'm your host for this workshop. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today, our team is joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagura people in Brisbane and the Wurundjeri people in Melbourne. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I also invite you to pay your respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which you are joining us from, and you can do that by writing it in the Zoom chat. Here at the Australian BioCommons, we are building digital capability for the life sciences with the goal of ensuring that Australian researchers can remain globally competitive. The Bring Your Own Data project is a key part of this vision and is a collaboration between multiple Australian organisations. The goal of the BYOD project is to bring highly accessible, available and scalable data analysis and sharing capabilities to life science researchers. The tools and resources we're working on include online bioinformatics workbenches, command line workflows and tools and data infrastructure. And Janice, which you're here to learn about today, is one of these. So this workshop has been, and the accompanying materials, has been jointly developed by the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and Melbourne Bioinformatics as part of the BYOD project. And the infrastructure that you will be using during this workshop is provided by NCI and RNET. Taking you through the workshop today are Grace Hall, who is a software engineer at Melbourne Bioinformatics, and Richard Lupert, who is a senior bioinformatics software engineer at the Peter Mac. Behind the scenes, we also have Matthew Downton, who's been setting up the VMs that you'll be using, and Alex Ip, who's been looking after some of the VM infrastructure as well. Hello, thanks for that, Melissa. Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, I suppose I'd like to just say a brief statement about like why we're here today and then we'll make sure we're all set up on our um, VMs and everything's sorted on that front. And then we'll go through kind of the first section where I'll talk about, you know, Janus and CWL translations, and then we'll do some CWL tool translations and a CWL workflow translation, and that'll be the first section. So yeah, basically, hopefully we're here today because we work with workflows. Um, and the real point of the software we've been developing recently or, or the direction we've taken recently with this new feature is so that if you have kind of um, legacy workflows or you want to access a workflow that's written in a, a language that you're not familiar with, um, you'd be able to translate that into something that's being used, you know, by your institute more, or, or it's just more current. Um, so a lot of people are, are quite interested in Nextflow. Um, so that's going to be kind of the point of the workshop today is we're going to take some CWL and Galaxy tools and workflows. Uh, we're going to show you our tool that we're, you know, developing uh, as part of Janus, Janus Translate, uh, which will help you migrate them from CWL or Galaxy into Nextflow. Um, and the, the hope is that through this session, um, the tool, you'll find the tools useful for you. And we'll also be able to kind of get some feedback on in terms of what you think about the tool and what features you might want to see. Um, and so we can kind of like continue to, to progress from there. So to start, there was a bit of setup instructions that were sent out um, in an email. Uh, so just in case anyone hasn't had a chance yet to look at that, um, I'll just go through the process of uh, logging into the VMs that we're going to use today. So First of all, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Can you see the Visual Studio Code window here, Melissa? Yes. Great. So today I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code. Um, we're going to be using VMs provided by Niren Cloud. Uh, 
And Visual Studio Code is the, the thing we're kind of suggesting today because we can use a feature called or an extension called Remote SSH to log into that VM and work with Visual Studio Code, which is this really powerful kind of IDE, um, and work work in that VM kind of like it was our local computer. So that it means that you know we have access to all the normal stuff that we like when we do coding, but we're working on the VM uh system so first of all um if you haven't downloaded uh sorry i probably should ask because everyone got visual studio code please just like um it's totally fine just raise your hand if you haven't got visual studio code installed on your computer okay lots of people saying yes yeah that'd be great um Okay, I'll kind of assume that we have Visual Studio Code in that case. Um, who else do we have to go? Marie, Marie, Miriam, and Uma, are you okay? Visual Studio Code, yes? Okay, great. In that case, um, the next step is just make sure you have the extension, or the two extensions that we're gonna use today. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you've got this kind of like toolkit of different things you can do. The extensions tab there, it's got this kind of like four squares. If you click on that um, and you type in next flow, then you'll see uh, some stuff over here where you can install you know, next flow language support, which just means it's got some like syntax highlighting and that kind of thing. So I'm going to install it. And it shouldn't very, take very long. It's basically just to make working with Nextel a little bit easier. The other extension we're going to need is remote SSH. So if you just type in remote SSH, you'll get another list of search results. And we want this top one here. So I've installed it, so it doesn't say install uh, for me, but if you haven't installed it, just click the install button and it will set up remote SSH on your system. And this is the, it's a really fantastic extension. This is the thing that we're going to use to enable us to log into our VMs as if they were our local computer. Is anyone having an issue so far or is that all covered? Just, you know, raise your hand or speak up um, if you are having any issues with that. Okay, looking good. All right, well, what we want to do then is actually log into our VMs that we're going to be using today. So the way you do it is uh, you can do Control-Shift-P Command should pay if you're on a Mac. Uh, you want to bring up the command palette. I think you can also do it in here somehow. I'm so used to all the hotkeys that I'm not used to doing it by a select, but yeah, there it is there. So if you need to, you can go view command palette. And then you should see, if you start typing remote, you should see something like this pop up, uh, remote SSH. Etc. So click connect connect to host. If you've already gone through the setup, your your IP address for your VM should be there. Um, but if you need to, you can click add new SSH host, and then you can provide the uh, VM IP that you've been given before. So if I wanted to add new one training at and then I go and copy my IP. I'll grab you your the Excel spreadsheet and put it in the chat um, so you can look up what your your VM IP address is now. So go here. I've just put that in the chat for you. Okay, brilliant. I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna show you another screen share. Just so you know what you should be seeing. But 
but this is the spreadsheet we're talking about. Here's the IV address and that's your password. We'll get that into, into that in a second. So for me, if I want to configure a new host, I'm going to copy this section, the IP address, and then back in Visual Studio, I go to training at, and then I paste my IP address there. You can just select anything that you'd like to update. This is just so Visual Studio Code has a record of this new IP, so it doesn't, you know, you don't have to do it again. So if you've added that, you can then go connect to host. You can, it should show up now here. You can click on it and it'll open a new window. Once you've got the new window, you'll enter your password here. So for me, this is the, that spreadsheet. I've, I've used my IP address now and I'm gonna copy my, I, my password and then I'm gonna just paste it in there. And if it's worked in the bottom left, you should have a little icon, a little kind of notifier here that says SSH and then your IP address. So that's how you know that you're actually logged into the VM that we're going to be using for today. Now, if when you first log in, you actually haven't gone into, you haven't opened a folder that you're going to be working in. So we've kind of just opened our Visual Studio on the VM, but what we'll do is we'll go on top left Explorer and we'll click open folder. And the one that pops up by default is one we, the one we want to keep. So you can just press OK. And if needed, if it prompts you again, it may ask for your password again. Just paste in your password. If everything's been set up correctly, then you should probably see something like this. Go like a data.tar.gz file. Um, as well as some other like miscellaneous things that the this home directory has on the server. Okay, so I'll just ask everyone to do the like yes kind of react uh, when you've actually been able to successfully log in so that we can, you know, if you're having a problem, it's fine, we'll troubleshoot it. Now you guys are awesome. Very impressed. It's the kind of thing where I, when when I first did it, it was a bit of like a head scratcher, and I had to try it a few times. So good job. Oh well, yeah, well, officially welcome everyone. Thanks for coming, and hopefully this is going to be a really uh, useful session. <clears throat> We're definitely going to be like showing off the software that we've done, we, that we've created, and we'll get your like feedback on that. But we'd also, um, we're also gonna have a lot of opportunity to do some proper NextFlow debugging. Uh, the final workflow that we translate is, has some errors and it gives us a really good chance to go through and like debug some NextFlow error messages. So I, I know that while I was making this material, I definitely got better at like understanding and, and reading all of the NextFlow debug messages because they're not always super like intuitive. Um, so hopefully today by the end of the session, we'll be, you know, we will have upskilled ourselves in, in NextFlow as well as, you know, understanding what, what Janice is about and how you can migrate workflows. Okay. So bioinformatics workflows, I'm sure we're all very familiar with what they are, but uh, at its core, they just chain multiple tasks together to perform an analysis. So they've got some inputs, they do some things in the center and they've got some outputs. They really can be written in any language as well. You know, you can have Python workflows that execute a bunch of different processes using the subprocess module. You can have a bash script, you can use a proper like workflow language like Nextflow, Snakemare, Gwiddle, CWL. Um, but the point is they're kind of like pieces of software that we do actually invest quite a lot in to get them functioning. And once they're created, they do need some maintenance over time. 
uh, and we'd hopefully like them to be used by as many people as possible. Now, there's a lot of kind of choices when you're thinking about writing a workflow. A while ago, people used to just use Bash and Perl scripts, uh, but you know, in, in today's age, we've got custom workflow languages that are specifically designed to do this. But when choosing a workflow language, really, there's a lot of different things that might play into it. Uh, you might be really familiar and prefer to use, for example, Nextflow, but the stand in the field that you're working in might be CWL. And you probably do want to use CWL in that case because everyone's used to it. Everyone's got skills with that workflow language and it will be more shareable and I guess accessible by your community. There's a lot of other things as well, like different workflow languages have different feature sets. Uh, they, some of them work really well on diverse compute environments these days, while others are kind of more like uh, spe specifically for a HPC or specifically for a local computer rather than cloud. When making the choice of a worker language, it's really quite important because they're going to be an investment. Like you're going to spend a lot of time and money making these workflows. You're going to develop skills in your lab group about those workflows. Um, and so the decision you make in terms of uh, which workflow language to pick can be really, really important because they are quite an investment upfront and also going on to, into the future. Unfortunately, we do know that like workflow languages come and go out of fashion. It's just the same with programming languages, same with anything. Uh, new things come along which are better or maybe they're just better at solving one particular problem. So I, I just did a Google search, Google trend search, um, which can kind of display that worker languages on a whole are, are really on the rise. And the ones which are the most popular really depend. Like back in 2016-ish, uh, Snakemake was very popular. Snakemake is quite popular because not specifically bioinformatics. There's a lot of other fields which use Snakemake. Um, but, you know, like BPipe and CWL and WDL were all pretty much quite popular and, and essentially like just field-based. But you can say that over time, like Snakemake and, and Nextflow have really uh, become very popular. And recently in the last kind of two or three years, Nextflow has been become the most popular workflow spec to use. It's also really region dependent too. I don't know if you can see this little breakdown, but back in 2018 in the United States, mostly it was, you know, Nextflow and Snakemake uh, with some CWL and WDL uh, and BPipe in there, except for Thailand, which for some reason already was on the Nextflow game. Maybe that is a bit of ahead of the curve. Uh, but then fast forward to like 2023, I guess like four or five years later, and in Nextflow, it's it's most sorry in U, in the USA, it's mostly Nextflow with some Snake Make and some BPipe, and Thailand is still going strong with the Nextflow. So yeah, in four or five years, the whole world can kind of flip in terms of what workflow is the most popular for language. So it's very hard to choose the correct workflow language you can use for a project because they go in and out of fashion and because your requirements might be specific. Um, you also have to think about like the talent that you've got in your group. You know, are they familiar with CWL or Nextflow or some other spec? And you have to take that into account. So it's really a divided space and picking the correct one isn't really necessarily particularly possible. We can't even really answer, ask the question of like, which, which language is going to be the one, um, because they all have different spaces. And for example, programming languages, you know, we've got Python, we've got C++, we've got JavaScript, got Java. There's a lot of them and they're all popular for different reasons. They're all used for different reasons. So I think that the space is going to be probably continued to be divided. And there's really no like workflow language in particular that's going to win and just dominate everything and every workflow is going to be written in it. That kind of leads into Janus and the point of this project that's been kind of going on for the last five years and will be going on for a little bit in the future too. So the Portable Pipelines project was uh, created back in 2018 and Janus is part of the Portable Pipelines project. It's a collaboration between a lot of institutes here in Melbourne, like the Parkville Precinct, so Peter Mac Cancer Centre, 
Lombard Informatics, where I'm from. So Rich is from Peter Mac. I'm from Lombard Informatics. As well as We High and Australian Biocommons, which are kind of supporting the project as we go through. The initial goal was uh, around share, shared cancer bioinformatics pipelines across the whole precinct. Uh, it's definitely a case of like lots of different institutes having their own pipelines, and we thought it'd be a great idea. Well, I, I wasn't part of the project at that stage. Richard and the others thought it'd be a great idea if we could have these shared pipelines uh, for the whole uh, precinct. But it posed the question, like, which language should they be written in? It was a challenge because some of the institutes uh, preferred one language over another, and they all had really different compute environments that they were going to be running these workflows on. So it was quite a challenge. <clears throat> so instead of committing to a single language, uh, Chance was built because it would be a way for us kind of not to, to lock into a particular spec. Janus is a framework which transpiles to CWL or WDL, so you can write your workflow in Janus. And then if people preferred WDL, they could transpile to WDL. If they preferred CWL, like that was their group in the Parkville kind of precinct was using CWL a lot, they could transpile to CWL. It's also type safe. They can become warnings or proper errors depending on how you use Janus. Uh, and, and the idea here is that, you know, bioinformatics workflows really depends. It, you can have errors happen because of data types being wrong. So Janus is kind of there to also tell you if you've made a connection in your workflow where the types don't match. One of the other requirements is that they would have to be able to uh, allow relatively flexible execution across the different compute environments. And that was one of the things that was a benefit about transpiling to CWL and WDL is that across those two, that for each you know, group, um, they'd be able to execute it on their local compute. And one of the additional things was it was designed in such a way that if a new workflow system needed to be supported, like an XO, uh, it could be added in the future as a translation target. So you could translate from Janus to Nextflow or Janus to, to Whittle. So in 2019, this is kind of how it looked. We had Janus transpiling to CWL and WDL, uh, which could be used by the associated institutes taking part in the project. And then people can kind of like execute it with the execution engine and the compute that they had. So fast forward to 2021, uh, there have been more than a dozen pipelines centering around cancer that had been written and run on, on real-world data at Peter Mac. Uh, but at this stage, Nexo was really taking over and had been something that we thought we should probably be supported. In that time as well, CWL, SnakeMade, Nexo, all these kind of workflow specs, they've really pushed a kind of like flexible execution idea. So they, they had ways for you to execute the workflows in cloud, local computer, HPC, et cetera. So we kind of sat back and looked at our product and thought, what are we offering that's unique? And we thought that that was probably the translation or the translation uh, part of Janus that was unique. So we started uh, working on a new feature, which is centered around translation. So instead of just writing in Janus and, tran and translating out to CWL or WTL, a user could say, hey, I've got the CWL workflow. Can you please translate it to WDL or Nextflow, something like that? So a whole whole end-to-end -end kind of job. So with the initial kind of like offering, we had Janus translating to Whittle and CWL. And then 2021, it's like, okay, this is kind of what we want to build going to the future. So what you're gonna see today is kind of like our best attempt at realizing that goal. It's Turns out it's a very challenging thing to do because of the differences in all, all the specs. Um, and, but yeah, we're gonna kind of like have a look at what, we, what we've come up with. So the idea is that Janus Translate is a feature of Janus and it helps you migrate workflows from one, one spec to another. So the idea is it's really a productivity tool, uh, cuts down on the boilerplate you have to write. And it aims for like human readable translations rather than machine runnable with the idea that if you've got a CW workflow, use Janus Translate, 
to Nextflow, whatever, and that will get you most of the way. And then you'll go through and do some touch ups, and then you'll have your kind of finalized workflow. This is the syntax, and we'll be using it today. You just say Janus translate dash dash from the source language dash dash to target language, destination language, and then you point it to the main workflow file. So for example, with this Galaxy workflow, you just need to point it at the main workflow file. Janus, during its uh, translation process, will go through the file, it looks up all the tools and stuff that it needs, it contacts the Galaxy API and grabs all the actual individual tool wrappers, passes them, passes the workflow, creates our internal model, and then from there, it pushes it all out to Nextflow. So, you know, this unicycler workflow goes demo. That's, uh, it's got like five tools in the workflow, six tools. So all of them will be uh, accessed online and they'll be translated. And then you'll, you'll get out a bunch of Nextflow. You'll get like a main Nextflow, which is the actual workflow. And then all of your processes will be translated too. So yeah, it turns out translations are really hard, especially when we're supporting such a diverse feature set across the languages that we do. So, so we are gonna do some manual touch-ups today. Um, also, I'd just like to flag that this build that we're using today is kind of, it's not an official build, it's like a development build that we've prepared for the workshop, but there'll be an official new build of Janus, um, release 0 0.13 in the next couple of weeks, and that will kind of be the one we're offering uh, officially. So this is, yeah, this is just a development build, um, but there'll be a proper official one soon to follow. Cool. All right. So that kind of like sets us up from the start. Um, we're going to split the session into two groups. We'll do CWL to next flow translations at the start. Then we'll take a quick break and then we'll swap to Galaxy. Just like to say that this is uh, definitely a, like a diverse set of institutes and people who've been involved with the Janus project and as well getting this uh, workshop together. So thank you, Melissa, for doing a lot of all of the things that make a workflow workshop possible. So I'm going to say workflow and I mean workshop a lot today because I just say that word too many times. Um, but as well, thanks to Matthew Downton for helping us set up today. Uh, Alex, he's here today. He's kind of our support person for, um, for the Niren cloud, which we are using the VMs, uh, as well as Georgie for all the kind of like templates and uh, Audrey, who was previously involved when we were thinking of doing this on Pawsey compute rather than Niren. So I'm sure most of you are aware of what CWL is. It's a open standard for describing command line tools and connection them to create a workflow. So it's not necessarily uh, the same as Nextflow, which has a syntax and its execution built in together. Next, uh, CWL is really just a standard and there's a bunch of different execution engines which will run CWL, um, but really it's just a standard. They're not, they're not offering anything more than just a, a set of instructions on how you can write or describe a workflow in CWL. CWL focuses on reproducibility, portability, interoperability. So it's quite um, verbose. People say a lot about CWL, very verbose, but uh, it's definitely a format that's easier to read in and use by other third-party kind of software. So CWL is very widespread. It was an original translation target. So we're supporting it now in terms of translation out to CWL as well as translation in, so from CWL to a different spec. Got a lot of nice features as well, like CWL viewer, Rabbix Composer, that's a legacy thing now, they're not really supporting it anymore, but it's pretty fully featured. And um, basically the only issue sometimes people have with it, it's, it's got a bit of a steep learning curve and the syntax is verbose, but once you get going with it, it's a pretty pretty great one. Uh, it's got quite a restricted spe specific grammar. Um, I think one of the things about CWL that people have an issue with that other, other languages kind of excel at is the fact that it's only each CWL command line tool is only supposed to execute a single command. So it doesn't really expect you to do multiple things like 
uh, align some reads to a genome and then run a SAM tools command and then run another SAM tools command to like maybe sort and index that genome. It's more like HCWL tool is just a single command you run on the command line. A little bit different to way people often write pipelines, like when they're drafting them or in bash. Um, and so I think Nextflow has become kind of popular partly because the script section is what we're kind of used to writing on the command line itself, and you're allowed to do multiple commands. You can do samples index, then samples sort, blah, blah, blah. So the users of CWL are mostly like career bioinformaticians, steep learning curve, but it's quite high profile. And once you get used to it, it's, it's pretty good. The main thing is it still tends to be verbose. If you're curious, there's a lot of uh, openly accessible public data for CWL workflows and tools. So that we've just put a couple of GitHub repos here. Uh, they're fully available for you to download in case you want to run some of the pipelines listed here. Uh, but yes, if you want to look for where some CWL workflows are, then GitHub and GitLab is kind of your best bet. Most people put their public data on those resources. There's also, of course, Workflow Hub, which has, I think, 50 CWL workflows. So today we're going to be translating two CWL tools, command line tools, from, next, from CWL to Nextflow, and then we're going to do a, a translation of a CWL workflow as well. Yes. So now that that's done, let's kind of get started, do some translations, look at some CWL and Nextflow and really get things going. Okay. So I've got a, the material here. What I've done is I've just um, pulled up the command palette and, and said simple browser show and then pasted the URL of the workshop material. You're more than, more than happy for you to do that. Uh, but if you'd like, you can keep it as a separate browser window. I'm going to have it here because it kind of makes it easy for me to like show my code window and, and the material. Um, and if you use this, you can kind of like, uh, you can make a new file. So make an Excel process and like that. It pops up here next to it as a tab, but I can always swap back to the, the browser. So feel free to follow along like that if you like. Okay, so the first thing that we'll do is I'll just show you where we're starting from the material. We've kind of done the introductory stuff. Scroll down past contents and we're at section 1.1 SAM tools flag stat tool. Let's give you a sec. By the way, totally sing out if you're having any issues. This is supposed to be like that. Uh, more of an interactive session than anything. You know, this isn't one of those ones where it's like, I just talk. I mean, it might turn into that depending on how people go, but um, especially with this kind of thing, we're running on VMs, you know, people are gonna have issues. So, and don't be shy in, in terms of like speaking up and, and asking for help or just asking questions. All right, okay. So the first thing we're gonna be doing is, is translating uh, CWL uh, Santos Flagstat definition from CWL to Nextflow. I put a little link here for the source GitHub. It's in the uh, McDonald Genome Institute's Analysis Workflows Repository. It's just one of their tools. You click on this, it'll take you to the actual CWL file in the in your browser. Okay. So today we're going to be using a container to run Janus Translate. We're going to be doing basically everything in containers today because it makes things a lot easier to use. Uh, so what we're going to do is firstly, we're going to grab the container, the Janus Translate container that we're using. You'll see as well, we're using Singularity. Um, it's kind of best practices within bioinformatics, always use Singularity if you can, because different HPCs uh, they might not let you have root privileges, which Docker wants you to have. Um, so a lot of bioinformatics, instead of Docker, we use Singularity, but it, it works basically the same. 
So go ahead and copy this. You can just click the copy a clipboard icon that Melissa was talking about before. And then what you're gonna to need to do, you might not see a terminal, you might just see essentially nothing. Top uh, menu bar, click terminal, and then new terminal. And that should show you what I was looking at before. It's just a, a terminal kind of thing. Yours might be like this. That's totally fine as well. Um, but I just personally prefer to have it on the left. So I'm going to do it like that. So yeah, copy this statement here, sing the singularity pull statement, chuck it into your terminal, and then press enter. And singularity will start pulling the Janus Translate image. Now I've been using this VM to test, so I already have the Janus Translate image locally. But yours might take a couple minutes, depending on your internet connection or the VM's internet connection, but it's not a particularly large image. It's about 500 megabytes, so it should only take a few minutes to finish, if that. Now, once you've got your image, just to check that it's working and we can actually use Janus Translate, I'll get you to copy and paste this second command here, like that. And if everything's working, it should just say the Janus Translate help text. So you get something like this. Chris, would you mind uh, just demonstrating again how you got your browser to show in VS Code, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just as a side note, before we continue, please don't move on to the downloading training data. We've already put the training data here for you, the data.tar.gz. So definitely don't get it again because it can take up to 60 minutes to download if it's a slow connection. Please just leave it there and we're going to unzip the archive in a second. How I got the simple browser was um, if you do command shift P or you can go into view, command palette, you start typing simple browser, you should get this thing appear here. You just press enter and then you can paste in the URL that you want. So for us today, it is the training material. Um, is that still in the chat, Melissa? It is in the chat, yes. Awesome. Okay, while that's doing its thing, what I might do is show you the first tool in CWL that we're going to be translating. So I'm just going to click on this link. You know what? I'll do it here. Do that. It's going to render. No, I don't think it's clever enough to render. Okay. That's all right. I'm just going to paste it here so we can have a look at it. So this is the first CWL tool that we're going to be translating today. It's basically just a, hey, here's how to do it. It's pretty easy because there's not going to be any issues in translating a tool that's this kind of small. But I'll just go through it really quickly so we're on the same page in case you're not particularly familiar with CWL. And just remember to click like yes once you've got the singular, the Janus singularity image pulled and you've run the singularity exec Janus translate and you see the help text. So this is the first tool that we're going to be using. It's written in CWL version 1.0. You can see it's called Central's flag stat, and the base command is calling a local binary, samples, and then the flag stat there. So if written in Nextflow, what your script is going to look like is it's going to start like this.
and then the rest of the arguments that we see in CFW are really going to follow. So that's kind of what, what base command is talking about. It's additional arguments that appear first. After that, we've got a single input. So we see it's, uh, it's a file type, it's a BAM file, and it's got secondaries. Uh, so what, what that means, of course, is it's an index BAM, so it's got a BAM file and a BI file there. So index load, script section is probably going to look something like that. And then we have a uh, standard out, we're collecting our output from standard out. So in next you might want to write something like that. Uh, output. One syntax text, something like that, is maybe how you'd write this if you were going to write it yourself in Nextflow. The only thing we have to talk about is that they've listed a container image. So that means that uh, we can run this image and it, that's how we're going to like resolve our software dependencies in our environment. Um, and I think that's basically everything to talk about. The only other thing is just RAM and it's got some a resource requirement there. So Genesis Translate will be able to pass all of this stuff. So when it creates a process, it will add that as the container. Um, it will set this up as the first positional arguments. Then it will have something to do with BAM, the BAM file. It will also prepare the process inputs and outputs for us as well. So what we'll get out of doing this translation is, is essentially like a one-to-one -one translation to next slide for this one. Okay. Um, is anyone still downloading the Singularity Janus image? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I assume we're all, we're all good then. So we've got Janus and we can run it. Now what we need is the sample data. So the data we've got for today, it's uh, it's here in this folder called data.tar.gz, this tar archive. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract the archive, and inside of that, we're going to have the sample data, the source CWL and Galaxy files, as well as like the finalized translations, which you can just look as a reference. You know, that's what we're going to be working towards today. So we're going to just do a normal tar unarchive command, tar xvf data.tar.gz. And that should also be in the materials there. So don't do definitely don't do the w get command. We've already got the data. Just ignore that. Just do tar xvf data.tar.gz. And once you start running that, it will you know inflate the archive. And you'll see this kind of structure here in the outputs. We've got like a, a data master folder. We've got sample data. So that's the test data we're going to be running today, making sure our next door translations are accurate. And we can you know, run sample data and we get results that we expect. And there's also going to be a source directory, which contains the CWL and Galaxy, and a final directory, which contains all the next door translations we're going to build. Any questions so far? Am I not? Cool. Sounds good. Okay, well, mine's finished. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like. I have this folder called data. And inside of it, we've got three files. Source, we've got CWL. That's the CWL tools and workflow we're going to be translating. Same with Galaxy. We've got the Galaxy workflow and the Galaxy tool wrappers. The sample data contains all of the stuff that we're going to be running tests for. So CWL, it's all these BAM files and genome annotations and stuff. And in the final folder, that's our reference material for you today. So if you are ever confused at any point and you want to go look at what the final solution is kind of thing, um, then you can just go into this respective folder. So for the first section, we're doing SAM tools flag start. So data final. CWL, Santos, Flagstat, and there's, this is what we're going to be building towards today. So we've got an XY file and an XY.config. Okay. 
Something I might mention here too is we're going to start off using the data in sample data here, but we've also got the data prepared on CVMFS, which is the CERN VM file system. Uh, and we're going to be halfway through, we're going to be swapping to using that and just kind of testing out how it goes um, to see if we can run our stuff with that as well. So there's a little bit of a note here, but that's repeated later. So we can just ignore it for now. Okay. So now that we've got Janice, we've got the data, we can do our first translation. So to translate a tool or a workflow, this is the syntax that we use here. And I've kind of already gone through that, so it should be fairly self-explanatory. But because we're using a singularity image, we're going to do singularity exact, exact, and then the image there. So that's going to be the way we start our commands. And then it's just as normal. So Janice translate dash dash from CWL to next or whatever. So because our source file is in the path uh, data C, a source CWL uh, samples flag stat. So source CWL samples flag stat. That's how far we're going to be translating now. That's what we're going to be pointing Janice translate to. So you can just copy this command here. You can write it out yourself, but it should work fine. Just paste it in and press enter, and that will translate that CWL tool into Nextflow for you. Cool. So once it's finished, you'll see a new folder called translated appear. And inside of it will be, because we're just doing a translation of a tool, all that we create for you is a process, Nextflow process for that tool. So if you look at it, open it up, that's your translation. So that's what Janus Translate has created for you. I might just pause here briefly, go through what I've just done. So make sure you untie your data archive, then run the Janus Translate command and just have a look at your output. And once you've done that, if I could get you to press the yes react, that'd be fantastic. And if you're having kind of uh, issues and you feel a little bit lost, that's totally okay too. We can do some troubleshooting in the chat or you can just ask me a question or if you'd like, we can do potentially a breakout room if that's okay, Melissa. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like it's working for some people. Who here is familiar with Nextflow? Like, who, who here would say that Nextflow is kind of their main language that they use rather than CWL or anything like that? Anyone? Not really. So maybe, uh, okay, we've got one. Georgie. Yeah, nice. Cool. Okay. At least some people here are quite familiar with Nextflow. I know there's a few familiar faces from our recent Nextflow workflow, uh, workshops. Yeah. Now I'm doing it too. <laughs> on okay, this cool. workshop. So uh, I think most people should have at least seen some next one before, if not be totally pro at it. So. Awesome. Well, this first tool will be a good way for us to just do a refresher on how Nextflow works and what the syntax looks like and how to run Nextflow workflows. Because from this process, we're actually going to turn into a workflow with a few lines of code, and then we're going to run it on our sample data. First thing I want to kind of bring your attention to, which is explained in the material. Just scrolling down here, it shows you what your process should look like. And then there's just some, some notes here about what I'm about to say, which is that this might be a little bit surprising to you, what you see here, def bam equals bam zero. If not, then great. But what this is, is that the BAM file is an index BAM, so it has a .BAM file and it has a .by file, and they've got to be in the same location for most tools to run. So next, next way the way it runs is, unless you specifically you know, stage something into the working directory by saying, hey, this is a path, uh, the files that are given to you here, they're, they're actual paths, please stage them into the process working directory, they won't be there. So this path BAM process input here is 
actually two files. It's going to be the BAM file and the BI file. That's what we're expecting here. We expect them to come together so that Nextflow stages them both next to each other in, in the process working directory. So what we see down here is just a kind of convention that we've come up with with Janus Translate. You know, we can build it however we want, and we've tried to make it as close to the Nextflow best practices as possible, while also kind of supporting the feature sets that other languages do. So this is just a quick redefinition to say, hey, when you're referring to the BAM, what you're trying to refer to is actually the BAM file, not the BI file, which comes second. Then we see what we kind of expect, SAM tools, flag start on the, the input BAM. And it's also created a output for us, this standard out here, which is based on the BAM file. If we look at the source CWL, we can see that um, the reason it's done that is it's specifying that it wants to collect the standard out, but you really should only do that in Nextflow when it's not a file. Like if it's just a value that you're passing back from process, yeah, you can use standard out, but usually you really shouldn't. You should collect a file. You should create a file and then collect it. So the Janus Translate has gone through. It's looked at this kind of statement here, it says, okay, we're going to be collecting standard out uh, as this name. But it also says that this should be the file name, which is dynamically created from the input BAM with dot flag stat added on the end. So when we come to our next flow translation, that's why you kind of see it the way it is. Um, the input BAM, its name, we append dot flag stat on it to the end. We send the output, the standard output to that file, and then we actually collect that file there with the same name as you know, in the CWL. So for all intents and purposes, this Nextflow process is identical to the CWL. The, the kind of translation we've got is a complete one-to-one -one translation, so it'll run fine. OK. Um, Let's add a, we're going to now move from like, we've got the process, let's run it as a workflow and just check that everything works. So first thing we'll do is let's add a, a published directory, directory directive so that we can collect our files in a specific folder once the next flow workflow is, is actually run. So to this process, we're going to add publish the outputs. So back in your next flow process, I'll just get you to add this line here. That's not the right thing. Copy you like that. So at the top of your process, just under the container directive, add publish dear with a capital D and then outputs. What this does in the next flow is just make sure that like any file that it collects or any output that it collects actually, uh, it will copy that we will make a sim link of that into the outputs directory. So when the workflow is run, we can just look at the outputs directory and all of our files that we've kind of marked you know, for collection are there. Once we've done that, the way we've kind of elected to do inputs as well as config in Janus Translate is to use just the single, a single file, which is kind of the convention nextflow.config. Um, so in there, we put this kind of stuff up the top, which is just config stuff telling next how to run. And then we actually put our inputs on the params variable there. And we found that the params variable is really good because the params variable is actually globally available. So if I was to write the param params dot my name in the next little config file, I could directly reference it right here, I could just go params dot, actually, yeah, you need to do it like that. And because the params var variable is globally available to every single process, every single workflow, sub workflow, while the workflow is running, you can just directly access it there. So what I'll get you to do is just copy this section of text. And in the translated directory where we've Janus Translates created that samples flag step process for us, just next to it, I'll get you to create a new file 
So I think you can go file, uh, new text file. Is that going to do it in the right location? Probably not. Just, just do it the way I do it, which is click on the samples flag start process. And then up in this kind of top bar here, go new file. And we'll call this nextflow.config. That will open it up for you. And then I'll get you to paste in that contents there. Any issues so far? Just to keep in mind, you can just raise your hand or you can just speak out, you know, talk over me if you'd like. It's completely fine. All good. Cool. Okay. This is just what we've just done is just set up our inputs. Um, as an FYI, if you run, if you're in this folder, right, and you run next flow, you just say next flow run samples.flagstat. That's all you actually need to run this kind of thing as a workflow because Nextflow will al always look for a nextflow.config file in that, in the same folder as the thing that you're actually running from. And if it is, it will load you know, the params and it's, its config details from there. In terms of the one we've actually set up, all we've done is set up a single input. It's just the BAM file. And uh, because this is an index BAM, we also want the BAM index. So it's got a link to the BAM file and the .bam.by file. And that's in the data.tar.gz that we extracted out into a folder. So if we actually try to go have a look for it, your home to it is the home directory and training. That's the working directory that we're in now. So if I go print working directory, home to training, we'll get very used to that today. And data, sample data, CWL, and then it's this file here. There's a little bit of an explanation as to what this is doing. Um, the main things to note is that we're telling Nextflow to use DSL2, which you should use these days if you can. Uh, we're telling it that we want to use Singularity, not Docker, not anything else. We're going to be using Singularity. And we're telling it where the cache directory is. So when it downloads um, images that, it, that the processes that it runs needs, it puts them into that folder. Later on, we're going to actually change that, but um, you can also just put an old path. So if you know the path to where your container image is, so if it's on like a local file system like CVMFS, you can just point it to the local path and that will work too. In the second section, we'll try accessing our data from CVMFS, but for now, let's just you know, use it as the material says. Okay, so we set up our inputs, we've got our next flow process, and all we need to do to run this as a workflow is add basically a workflow declaration at the top of the file. So I'm going to copy this section here under creating workflow and passing data. I'm just going to copy this. And then in my samples flag start.nf file, I'm just going to paste at the top. So above the process definition. And what this is doing is running samples flag stat. It's just wrapping it in a workflow. We've got an extra line here, which is just declaring a channel. We're saying we're going to make a channel called channel BAMs, and it's going to get uh, it's going to be from the path params.bam which is what we set up in our config. So next we've got config is like paths to our inputs. Then in the like main file running, declaring some channel, channels and variables maybe, and then we're going to run the workflow from there. The only thing I'd like to point out here is the dot two list. If you're a bit unfamiliar with next flow, two list, what it means is it groups everything in the channel together. So next flow, the way it uses channels, it's They've adopted the data flow paradigm. So usually anything in the channel, it just wants to like push it out, like emit it to any process that consumes it. 
So if we don't do two list, what will happen is it will try to run in the workflow, it will try to run sand tools flags about twice. The first time it'll pass at the BAM file and the second time it'll pass at the BY file because those are the two things in that channel. Two lists groups them together so that you know, Nextflow knows, okay, if this the BAM file and the BY file, they should travel together. So if we do it like this, it will just run a single sand tools flag stat process when the workflow runs. Okay, if you've set that up, making sure we've added the publish directory directive, creating Nextflow config, and adding these lines to the top of your samples flag Nextflow, we can go ahead and run it now. So I'm just gonna change into that directory. So the by default, Jazz Translate produces stuff in a directory called translated. So I'm gonna to swap to that directory there. I can see I've got my next flow config and my samples flags that the NF, and I'm just going to go ahead and run that. Next flow run samples flags that NF. And then we press enter and it should run. If it's your first time running this and you don't have the container, it might take a little bit of time to just pull this container. And if so, you know, just wait for a couple of minutes. And then once it's run, we'll check the outputs. So for me, it's finished running. I'll just go ahead and show you what the expected output is. Uh, we created a published a directive and said, please put the outputs of this process into a folder called outputs. So when we actually look in our translated folder, we've got the next config file, samples flag stat. We've got some nextflow things like the work directory and .nextflow. But this is the process output folder that we've specified here. So if I click outputs, there's a single file in it, and that's the file that's been produced by running samples flag stat. How's everyone going? Might you get you to just press do your yes thing again if you've gotten this translated? Sorry, if we've already done the translation. You've got it to run. Yes? Okay, cool. By the way, I'm, I'm kind of judging my pacing by how everyone goes. So in that case, everyone seems to be doing pretty good. I might pick up the pace a little bit. And uh, then eventually when some people start to say, hey, hey, slow down, then I'll slow down a bit. Cool. All right. Well, that was our first experience. Very simple tool. Uh, we'll do that again, but with a much more challenging CWL tool, and then we'll go ahead and do a CWL workflow. So let's move on now. We've done samples flags that, that worked pretty good. Now we're going to move to get K halfway to course. So this is more of like a normal tool. That samples one was really short, and this is going to be a more typical tool. So uh, again, this is from the same folder for same repositories we used before. This McDonald Genome Institute Analysis Workflows Repository, and it's just a pretty standard get K haplotype caller tool. I'll just show you what it looks like briefly. So in the in the data folder. Uh, looking at source, galaxy, yeah, okay, haplotype caller. So this is the one we're going to translate in a minute. And if you're familiar with CWL, this will look pretty standard. Uh, we're calling GAT K, adding some Java options and haplotype caller. And then there's some like inputs that follow on from that afterwards. And there's a single output. Um, no, I disregard that. That was just my error checking that I was doing. That's just a note that I put there. It's good. CWL, um, that's a comment in CWL, so it won't cause any issues. Uh, but yeah, it's got a bunch of different inputs and a single output. So what we're expecting our next web process is, again, the container, the base command, and then actually probably quite a few 
process inputs because this does have so many different inputs that it supports. And we're going to see some good stuff. You know, we've got like optional files, we've got optional string arrays, we've got secondary files, uh, we've got an enum, we've got lots of good stuff. So this will be interesting to test out Janus Translate and see how it goes. All right, so let's go back to the home directory. So you can just go like CD up. Or um, if you want, you can do just copy and paste that command there, just to make sure we're definitely in the train directory. So at that point, I'm, I'm in this like main directory here next to translated. Um, so we're going to translate that tool, but we've already got that translated folder. Um, and that's the default that Janice Translate uses. So let's create a new folder. But instead of like creating it or something like that and then moving files, we can just pass the argument dash O to Janice Translate, and that will tell us the output folder. So the command is going to be basically the same as before. We've got from CWL to next. So um, the file path is different because it's of course a different file that we're translating. Um, and the only thing we've added is this dash O haplotype caller. So it'll create a new folder called haplotype caller, not translated. So go ahead and copy that to clipboard or type into your terminal, whatever you like, and run it. Disregard the typical, you know, development build some debug message that I've kept in there. Um, and what you should see is the haplotype caller folder. Cool, so it looks like Janice has put the translations in there, which is what we wanted, and there's a single process scat haplotype caller.nf. And when you open it up, it's definitely a lot bigger than, you know, the previous tool. That's, of course, because it's much more complicated. Okay. Yeah, cool. So once you've done that, you should see something that looks like this. Um, we've got all of the inputs that we saw in the CWL, so they'll all be reflected here. We've got our simple, uh, sorry, our single output GVCF file. Um, we've got our container, and then we've got our command. We can kind of see it's the same structure. It's like these command line arguments that are kind of fixed. And then we've got all of our kind of inputs that we're adding. So I'll just explain some of these here and what's going on. There's also an expla explanation here in the workshop material. The first one is this BAM equals BAM zero. It's the same as what I talked about before. We've got two files in the BAM, a BAM and a BY. So what this is saying is, hey, when we're referring to BAM, we mean the BAM file, not, not like them together or something like that. Could you explain again why do we have so many definitions in a script and why we don't manage them in input? Yeah, okay. So the way I'll, I'll show you what the original CWL looks like data source CWL, okay, okay, have a top caller. So this is the CWL definition. Um, and it's got a bunch of different inputs that may be used or may may not be used, but they're, they're still kind of defined. So the idea is that this workflow is relatively flexible. So you could um, you could choose in one execution of the workflow to add this argument, this this input, and another one you could choose to leave that out. And because it's marked, marked optional, CWL will check it and it will only kind of template it into the actual command if it's there. So when we look at our next flow process, this is the way that we've basically chosen to create the same behavior in next flow. So if I go into the haplotype caller, get k haplotype caller, we see a lot of these, all the inputs are there, but you don't actually necessarily have to provide them real values. You can just provide them a null value. And based on that, it will, in the prescript section, it will check if they exist. And if they're not like a null value, then it will create the proper term for them. And then when we use that in the script, it's going to be injected correctly. So specifically, 
this is a great segue into like explaining some of these things and what they're doing. As I said, that's just to make sure we're selecting the first item in the index BAM. This is an example of an optional file input, which is also a secondary file. So this is an optional secondary file. What this is meaning is it's asking if the primary file, because again, it's gonna be passed as a list with all the secondary files in it. It's just, just one secondary file, but it checks if the first is not null, it's not a null file. So if, the, if we've actually passed it a real file, then what it does is it adds this, it, it templates this text out for us that we can then use in a script. So if we look down here, we're gonna be referring to that later. So it will, when we actually pass a real file for this, this secondary, it adds the dash dash db snip and then the file name for the primary file. And if it's null, like if we're not actually supplying anything, then it just templates an empty string. So if this were actually to run and we didn't provide a file, that's what it would look like. Uh, but if we did provide a file, then this is going to look like this when it runs. So we've kind of provided the file. So it's just a way for us to. Kind of create the same functionality that exists in all the workflow specs within Nextflow. Nextflow doesn't really actually want you to use null values and null files. It's kind of more like you just want to know what you're going to use. Um, optionality checking is, is this big debate within Nextflow, and there's like quite a lot of hacky ways to work around it. Um, but because we're trying to translate what we see in the original file. This is the output that we get. So, you know, we, we have to basically take that into account. So that's that's why we do it like that. Bit of a lengthy answer. It's it's a bit of a challenge trying to balance some um, best practices because, you know, CWO wants to do one things one way. Nextflow is a completely different paradigm. So trying to kind of balance those features and best practices is, has been challenging as we've been gone through. So this is kind of the best job that we can do, I think. <clears throat> All right, I think the only thing that I'd like to just else that I'd like to say here is that um, we're using dot join every now and again. So if it's an array of files, we're going to, for example, intervals, um, interval files, we, we're going to do like intervals dot join so that we're going to put them into a nice templated string so that when it appears in the command, it's the correct form. So breaking it down, the script section consists of the prescript where you can redefine variables and stuff. And then the main script, which is the command line string that we're going to template out. So with our translations, we often do stuff in here just so that we can enable features that are in other languages, like that kind of thing. Okay, this translation as well is correct. Don't need any changes, which is nice. Um, so we can just go ahead and do what we did before with sound tools and run it. Okay, this time we will try using CVMFS. So first let's um, add a published directory directive. So the published directory outputs. So copy that. Put that underneath your container. That's not the right sentence. Like that. Oh, so add that directive there. And then what we'll do as well, um, it's copied across the normal container that the CWL tool declared. But what we'll do is we'll just, we'll tell it to use the one that's on CVMFS and see if that works. So here, there's a little bit of a note down at the bottom, just under the collecting process outputs section in, okay, how to type caller running it. Um, you can also use this. So we're gonna just do that. We're gonna replace the container definition with that line there. So that's actually not like a, a registry URI. It's not saying like, hey, pull it from Quay or Docker. It's saying, Hey, please use this specific container located at this address on the file system. Cool. 
Is that been okay? Just remember to sing out if you're having any issues at any stage. Cool. All right, so we fixed up the process. Let's do the same thing as we did with, sing, um, with SAM tools, flag start and just turn into a workflow. So we're gonna create a nextflow.config like that. And by the way, when you do a workflow translation, the config file is created for you, but because we're just doing process, you know, tool translations, it, it isn't. So you create that config file and then go ahead and copy what we see in the material under the setting up nextflow.config heading. Should look similar to this. Now, let me know when you've done that. Just the people with the cameras might get you to like do one of these. If you've pasted the neck, the content to nextflow.config. Yeah. So, okay. Because for this one, we, we could leave the nextflow.config like this, but all we'll do is we'll use the CVFM, CM, CVMFS links instead. At the start, you know, we got our sample data and, and it is here, but we want to test out just to see if the CVMFS links work too. So you're, you're kind of our guinea pigs today. So in the next load of config, any time that we see a path starts with home to training data, what I'm going to get you to do is if you highlight that using Visual Studio Code, you can actually do Control D. If you press that a bunch of times, it'll like highlight every single time that that appears. So now you've got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven curses. And if you want it, you can just delete and start writing and it will replace them at every single location. So that's pretty nice. So instead of using that path, what we're going to use is, Richard, could I get you to post the path in the chat to the CVMFS? Okay. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. So anytime you see home to training data sample CWL, just like that, press control D a million times, the just goes to every single instance, and then just, just paste that in. This you can just delete it or press control V. Delete it, then press control V, or just press control V. And it should paste into every single location. Yeah. Bit of fun changing the paths at the last minute. Okay, so we set up next for config. The only thing we're going to do now is just wrap it in workflows, same as samples. So just scroll down a little bit, section creating workflow and passing data. I'm just going to copy this, go back to into GAT K haplotype caller. And just before the process, I'm going to paste it in there. Similar to before, all this is doing is creating some channels for us to pass through some files. And then we're calling GAT, GATK haplotype caller. And all the files we've got kind of listed there as channels. And the rest are calling variables in the global params object. And that's all been set up here in the next flow config sample that we'll copy and paste it and then change the links in. Okay, so I'm just gonna see if this works. Feel free to you know, follow along as well. You do it with me. So let's change directory into that directory. CD haplotype caller. Make sure I'm in the right folder. Yep, got the process in the config file. Let's go next flow run. No, that's not the right file. So used to writing that. Yeah, okay. Appetite caller.nf. 
by the way, if you're kind of relatively like, um, if, you, if you don't know yet, if you're writing a, a path, like if I'm, if I'm trying to say that I want to use this, this file here, okay, okay, how the type call it, and I start writing it in the, in the shell, you can just click tab and it, it knows that it knows all the names of the files and the folders in that directory. So you can just click tab and it will fill in the rest for you. Grace, just to flag that uh, some people might have duplicated oh, part of that path because they've still got a uh, sample forward slash CWL. So you will need to del del delete that. Yeah, okay, that's a great point. Yeah, uh, Richard's also added a note that because we're using CPMFS, yeah, okay, we're great, we've gone now. I'm going to have to add what he's just posted in the chats there, singularity.automounts equals true just so that it mounts the CVMFS file system uh, when the singularity container runs the process. And in terms of the actual content, yeah, just make sure that this is the path. CVMFS, this web address for training materials, chance sample data, CWL, and the file name. So it is quite long, uh, but make sure that especially this last little bit is what we expect. So Janus and sample data, CWL, and then we've got the file names there. This is the first time we've actually like, you know, done it, done testing with this, like with this specific setup. So I'll try it here. If it doesn't work, then I'll just um, revert back to the original. Okay, well, for me, I'm having some error. Um, we tried our best, but what we might do is just go back to the original. So feel free to like delete your next sort of config file or just or delete the contents. And let's just go back to what's in the material because we know this works. Copy that, paste it there. And what we'll do as well is we'll change the GATK haplotype caller container back to the previous one there. You can copy it when it just a, a little bit up in the notes in the running GATK Hapotype Porous workflow. That's the original container that we had. So I'm just going to go back into my process and put it there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, some errors coming there. Tends to, tends to happen. Um, you know, running things, especially when we're running like a lot of different technology stacks on top of each other and the singularity container as well. It's, you know, different people can put different software in different versions. Um, it's possible that GATK was in that container that we're using is at a different path or something like that. But if you're following along with me, make sure that you have the container as this one here. Add the publish directory directive and have your next flow config exactly as it appears in the training material. So just the same as this, so you can copy it like that. And then if we run it again, it should run. After we finish up this section, let's I think maybe we do our 10 minute break. And then we'll come we'll come back and we'll do the CWL workflow and continue on from there. Sounds like a plan to me. Yours might take a little bit of time, just the same as mine. Um, because you might be next one might be pulling a singularity container for you if it's the first time you run it and even if it's not uh gake hubble type caller just does take a little bit of time depending on the size of the sample data and the size of the uh vcfs and stuff like that so i expect this to take a couple of minutes but once it's done we should see the single output that we expect give me in mind it's going to be this g DCF. And because we've done a published directory directive, 
it's going to create a folder for us called outputs and the output will be in there. From this point as well, we'll kind of start speeding up. It's always a good idea to like start things off slow, make sure everyone doesn't get lost at the start because then it's hard to get them back later on. But now we've got like the first two things done. We'll do our break, come back, and then we'll pick up the pace a bit and start doing things quicker and more interesting things uh, in the translations that we do. Okay, mine's just finishing, finished running. I can check it by in that directory I'm working in, half type caller, click outputs, and there's the vcf.gz and the index right there, the vcf index there. And it looks like mine took two minutes to run. Cool, okay. Um, Let's do a 10 minute break. If, yes. you're, if you've just started running your next story workflow, just let it keep running. Go get a drink of water, cup of tea, something like that. Come back and we'll start doing some of the more interesting, fun stuff uh, when you're all back. Cool. All right. Well, we've done two tool translations, but most of you are probably doing full workflow translations. So that's what we're going to go through now. Scrolling down the material a little bit, we're now in section 1.3, align, sort, mark, dupe, workflow. This is from the same repository as before. It's a sub workflow that they use in some of their very large pipelines. Um, the main thing that it's doing is it's going to, this is just crazy to me, but they've got unaligned reads stored in multiple BAM files. And in FastQ files, here in BAM files. I have no idea why that's not particularly standard, but that's what they've got. They've got some, it's just a BAM file where it's got the reads and like the quality scores, but there's no alignment in information. So I don't personally know why they've got them in the BAM, in a BAM file format rather than FastQ, but you know, whatever. So we have essentially our reads in the reference genome. <clears throat> I'm going to do alignment and a bunch of other things. Um, and we're going to produce a finalized single BAM file storing alignments from all the read sets. So we've got like multiple input BAM files that are unaligned. It's going to do the alignment, sort index, merge, and then create this uh, mark duplicates and then produce a final index, which has got the alignments for all the different files in it. So as usual, let's go back to the correct directory, CD home to training. So put that in and you should be back in your like, you know, open work folder, you're in this directory. The workflow is at this link here. So it's, it's within the data folder, sample data source, CWL, align sort mark dupe, sub workflows, that's the file. So this is the main workflow file. And when you're using Janus Translate, you point it to that file and it will translate the workflow. It will also follow any links that it finds within the workflow. So any tools that are used or referenced, it will translate those too. So you can just, uh, as before, copy this command here. It's kind of the same as what we expect. All we're doing is saying Janus Translate, this is the output folder cwl to nexo and then pointing it to the main cwl file so we're just telling it the main cwl file there of the workflow yeah so you paste that in to your terminal run that and it should translate the work before you and produce a single folder called align sort mark dupe and that'll have the workflow translation in it So it's created it for me, align sort mark dupe. And if I look in that, we've got kind of what we expect. 
um, formatted in the standard approach that people often use for next flow workflows. So for me, I'm impressive. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> um, the main.nf file, that is the same, it's basically the same as the main workflow we point at Janus Translate to. So the, the main workflow will appear in main.nf. If there's any sub workflows, they'll appear in the sub workflow directory. So it looks like they've got one sub workflow here, just called a line. They're just doing one process in it. Um, and any Nextflow process definitions that are used in the workflow will be under modules. So it looks like we're doing some align and tag. <clears throat> I think alignment helper.sh, I don't know, it's some script that they've got. Uh, samples index, mark duplicates, merge, samples merge, and then sambar bar sort. So there's the processes that it's it's used. It's also created a nextflow.config file for us, and where possible, it's added some paths. So for example, um, it's got We've, we've kind of separated our stuff into headings. We've got inputs mandatory. So these are things you definitely have to address. If you want to run this as a workflow, you're going to have to put, provide values for these. It's got some optional inputs as well. So they, these are the main workflow inputs. And then there's like process specific stuff down that follows behind like that. So these are all the kind of things that are specific to different processes. Um, this has got this workflow. It clearly ref 